In Pokemon Infinite Fusion, you can fuse together any two Pokemon, and I'm gonna attempt the hardest difficulty as a hardcore Nuzlocke, where if any Pokemon faints, it's boxed forever, and I'm only allowed to catch the first Pokemon I find per route. Ooh, I hope my starters are good. That's gonna burn itself down. I definitely would consider picking Madame if it didn't look so dumb. Fortunately, my last choice is the most adorable thing I've ever seen. It's also an absolute beast, so take that, madam. L plus ratio plus dumb. With this being the hardest difficulty, I'm hoping for the strongest fusions possible. This is the opposite of what I'm talking about. Not a great start. Things start looking up when I pick up a Chimplup in Viridium Forest, but by far my most important capture before Brock is picking up a Gigon on Route 22. Not only is this thing a sick combination of Bagon and Gibble, it also gets Dragon Rage at level 7, which means that after Chimplup turns into a middle-aged Irish guy, we've got to take on Brock. It isn't much of a fight, however, since a couple of puffs from my angry dragon gets us the first gym badge without even breaking a sweat. With my first badge in hand, I start heading through Mount Moon, where my first encounter happens to be a Bell Palm. The long ball Pokemon? What are you, Bell Palm? Every old guy in my gym locker room? Get a towel for that wrinkly old- Anyway, Monplup evolves again, and I think I preferred the Irish guy. No, it evolved into Angry Birds. Here's the thing. To make this challenge a bit more difficult, I don't get to just take apart my fusions and combine them however I want, but I can turn my fusions into their other form. Now that's a lot better. We also need to prepare for our next big obstacle, the rival fight on Nugget Bridge. And while our grinding capabilities are pretty limited at this point in the game, I at least get Bell Palm to evolve into Metapalm. Hanging pretty low there, bud. Last time I faced Hornlad, we torched his Madum in seconds, but now that he's gotten the chance to collect a whole bunch of other dumb Pokemon, I don't expect he'll go down quite as easy. Unfortunately, I am completely correct as soon as I see his Wukot. The first turn of the fight, he does make me wonder why he goes for Gust, when the second turn, he fires off a super effective Mud Shot. I even even miss my second Metal Claw, making up for his wasted Gust turn. With so little health left, I've got no choice but to swap out into Gigon, which is when, with one click of a button, Hornlad sets us back all the way to the start of the fight. Mudshot isn't doing too much damage to Gigon, and we're even out damaging it with Headbutt. Mudshot does lower our speed, so we can't fish for flinches with Headbutt, but we can hope for a miss with Mud Bomb. In the end, this means that it did cost us most of the health of our two best Pokemon, but we can take out the Wukot. Madum, somehow looking even dumber, has evolved into quite the threat. I swap in Momplup, our only decent Pokemon at full health. And after taking a Revenge, I try for some damage with Flame Wheel, which is a big mistake since Revenge now deals more damage, leaving me at just 4 HP. I'm forced to swap out, sending in Chatterfang, whose time in the spotlight is shorter than I'm able to read this line. My Birds of Paradise are unfortunately a bit underleveled since the early game grinding takes so much time. Time that would have been well spent since the alternative I'm facing is losing my starter. Our birds did do some good work with that Nightshade though, since Matang is now in range of being taken out by a single Dragon Rage. All we have left now are three Pokemon at incredibly low health, but I end up lucking out since Hornlad's last two Pokemon are pretty pathetic and easy to take out with just a few Dragon Rages. We ended up making it through, but just barely. Moving on to take on our second gym challenge, I find out that it's a gym full of fairy types. After such a devastating rival fight, this is great news since I've got myself a metallic monkey. And as you might imagine, it doesn't take long before I've metal clawed my way through both of Misty's Pokemon. This monkey is nuts. Moving ahead towards Vermilion City, I head through Route 5 where I pick up my next encounter, a Yamelian. And before even getting to Vermilion after facing a trainer, Gigon evolves into Gagon. Not all names get to be 10 out of 10s. Before taking on Lieutenant Surge, I have a few Pokemon to catch, the first being a Swydial on Route 11. Pretty awesome Sandile and Swinub combo, best part is we get Intimidate. I then backtrack to Route 6, where my encounter's a Bunril. Buniri and Azumarill are actually a surprisingly good combination, especially once it evolves into Lothril. Don't let this thick-thighed normal fairy type fool ya, she's got huge power. And we're gonna put that huge power to use very effectively, especially since Lieutenant Surge has been randomized into having a team full of dragons. To some, it may be mortifyingly humiliating to lose to this bunny, but to others, I'm sure a bit of rough play from Lopral is exactly what they're dreaming of. Regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, Lieutenant Surge, I'll happily take that third gym badge. With it collected, our level cap increases quite substantially. This means most of our team can evolve, first Gagon into Gagon again, Galta then evolves into Mamrock, Shurikai evolves into Metpom, which is a horrible downgrade, but not even close to as bad as Jengitaxius turning into Monleon. Ooh, life's not been kind to you, buddy. 
Unfortunately, this isn't Jenga Taxius' final fate. When this ugly duckling reveals its final form, it's like the coolest Pokemon on our team. It doesn't take long for that spot to be overtaken, however, since a fusion between Charizard and Cuffagrigus is exactly as awesome as you would expect. Moving on through Route 9, we've got another randomized encounter to pick up, and I find a Pukazard. And I'm really glad it looks this cool and doesn't have Pukumuku's butthole face. <laughs> Okay, Perdos is legitimately going to give me nightmares. Once we reach Lavender Town, we do have to fight Hornlad, but because we found his greatest weakness, Thick Furries, we win in a massive landslide. What Pokemon came from a different planet? Venusaur! I know what you mean. Whatever Venusaur was on in Pokemon Stadium was definitely out of this world. Once we picked up the Silk Scope in the sewers, we've got to take on the fourth gym leader, Erika, who's got the misfortune of having an ice team. Half of our Pokemon are fire types, so you can imagine how this went down. Her ace was a Mambok, which I expected to give me some trouble because of its part ground typing, but it turns out our Pukazard is a pretty good answer to it. Her final Pokemon was a Peraris, which Pukazard could easily stall out since it's got no great moves to hit me with and I can heal off any damage with Recover. From there, I gave in to my dragon's pent-up frustration and claimed my fourth gym badge. Heading east to Route 7, I find my next encounter, a Nidamander. I then head back to the Celadon game corner, realizing we can pick up some of the strongest TMs in the game. On to Route 8, I find my next Next encounter, I, uh, Charmander has arrived. It's finally time to move through Lavender Tower, and with the Silph Scope, we can pick up an encounter, a Doo. This amazing looking dragon and steel type is exactly what our team needs. We then have to take on the Ghost Girl, who has a very appropriate Pokemon. Once Fuji then gives us the Poke Flute, we get access to the rest of Kanto that's reachable by foot. And upon reaching level 40, Galta reaches its awesome final form, Mamadile. Oh, I can't wait to use this thing. It looks so awesome. Sadly, I barely got to use Galta at all. In a horrible twist of fate, while I wasn't recording my path towards Fuchsia City, Galta ran into the most formidable of adversaries, Bonvi. You might think I'm joking, but Bonvi survived with Sturdy and knocked out Galta with a counter. And sadly, that's not where my trouble ended on the road towards Fuchsia City. After Jenga Taxis was taken down low by a Pokemon it just took out, the opponent sent in a Togabuffet, locking me in with Shadow Tag. The ultimate bamboozle had left me in a position where all I could do was click a move and watch my treasured Jenga Taxis go down. The counter was an awful surprise, but at least it was over immediately. This cruel method forced me to sit back and realize there was nothing I could do but watch my own demise. But now you die, you miserable son of a b Finally, I'd made it to my destination, Fuchsia City. And with a gym fight coming up, I evolve a couple of my boxed Pokemon, first one into Marizard, and my Chirino evolves into an old friend, Char King. I also bring back Shorakai, evolving into its final form, Metapalm. This this makes it time to take on the fifth gym leader, Koga. The guy is also randomized into an ice type gym leader. As you might imagine, that is not ideal when staring down a team with four Charizards. Taking out his first few Pokemon was fairly simple, but a lot of my Charizards got fairly low on health because of his water type moves. Unfortunately, this put me in a pretty bad position when facing his third Pokemon, a Lanx. My most specially defensive Zard is Pukazard, but it couldn't survive two Psychics at its current health, leading it to Puke out its guts in defeat. At least we've got Scytherix to take out a Lanx with a single Shadow Claw. What's Koga's ace? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty safe to say I collected that fifth gym badge. I then made my way to the Safari Zone to pick up Surf when I found a Dio Lurk. Staring down this great titan, a god amongst men, I tried to capture it, but didn't even get one single shake of the Pokeball. Meaning the Safari Zone got me nothing but the HM for Surf. So I made a beeline for my next destination, Saffron City, which has been overtaken by Team Rocket. Giovanni is scary in this game, especially this particular multi-battle, so I brought my best mods, including what Snorlax randomized into a Mewcross. Facing Giovanni is no joke. If the guy decides to team up on me, there's basically nothing I can do about losing a few Pokemon. He sends in a Glacro and Poliet, which shouldn't be too difficult Pokemon to deal with. 
So I fire off a close combat, hoping Glacrow is an ice and dark type, but it seems it's got its flying type intact. Oliet then uses Earthquake, which conveniently doesn't hit Glacrow, and that puts us in range to be taken out by Glacrow's Blizzard. I send in Shurikai to get a good matchup versus Glacrow, as our rival sends in Houndash. My strategy to bullet punch the Glacrow doesn't quite work out since Giovanni full restores it, but Houndash takes care of it by using Fire Blast. Poliet then uses Hyper Voice, hitting us both for pretty minuscule damage. Blistoof comes in and hits at a very high level relative to everything else. This turn, Poliet hits with a double super effective Earthquake, taking us both down into the red as I Meteor Mash the Blistoof, getting me an attack boost. Not one I'll ever get to use, though, since the Blistoof immediately takes Shurikai out with a superpower. Houndash gets close to taking out Poliet with a foul play, but not close enough, them being taken out by its Hyper Voice. I try getting in for lethal with a Flare Blitz against Blistoof, but I just barely fall short, fortunately taking it out with a burn. Hornlad sends in Q-Growth, and Giovanni sends in his Galroar. I'm hit by a punishment doing an insane amount of unboosted damage, and unfortunately, that puts me in range of a hyper voice. Q Growth gets revenge for me, but at this point, I've already lost half my team. It's a steep cost to pay for victory, but with a final play rough, Kalia closes out the match. And a pretty gutting match at that. Looking at all the Pokemon we currently own, we only have five to our name. With that in mind, we need to upgrade our team, starting by evolving the Mons we have. Draco evolves first into Garments, and I have no idea how this thing is a flying type. So instead, I decide to reverse the fusion into Salachom, which looks absolutely amazing. I've also brought Dewu back to the team, evolving it into its second final form, which looks like absolute garbage. Fortunately, defeating Silphco offers us the solution, since we can now buy Evolution Stones here in Goldenrod City. And while evolving into Aegirus makes it look much better, there's another sprite we can swap to in the Pokedex that looks absolutely insane. Nintendo, this is how you make a sword character. Aegislash was okay, Sword Doggo, eh? You really lost me with Sword Word. Before facing Sabrina, I fill out my team by capturing a Yalor, which, with a Dust Stone I just purchased from Goldenrod City, I can immediately evolve into Kofalor, that also has an amazing alternate sprite in the Pokedex. I've had fighting powers since I was a child. Guess you don't want to mess with baby Sabrina. <laughs> oh, my bad, bro. I dislike fighting, but if you wish, I shall show you my powers. A somewhat ridiculous scripted line for Sabrina to say, since she's got a team randomized full of fighting types. She begins with a Quagrath, which is a decent counter against Kofalur, but I manage to get a burn off before swapping out. I send in Kalia as the Quagrath sets up with Rain Dance, which might actually work in our favor since I've got Aqua Tail on the moveset. I then fire off a huge power play rough, instantly destroying Quagrath. She then sends in Miss Man Ape. <laughs> Okay then. Which does trap Kalia in with a fire spin, but I've got the rain boosted Aqua Tail to take it down into the yellow. After Sabrina heals up with a max potion, another Aqua Tail gets it down into the red. Miss Manape then goes for a flame wheel, taking me down to half as another Aqua Tail finishes the job. Sabrina then sends in her ace, Electro Champ, and being at such low health and a normal type, I swap out into Kofalur. After being hit by Discharge, I realize I may have made a huge mistake burning this Electro Champ since it might have guts. Regardless, we won't ever be hit by fighting type moves, so I'm just hoping it doesn't have spark. It seems like its only attacking move that can hit me is discharge, so after it bulks up a second time, I take it out without being punished at all. Finally, Sabrina has the fighting and psychic type Alachan, a fitting combination of who she used to be and who she currently is. Unfortunately, neither of those two people have a particularly good matchup versus ghost types, and I can take her out fairly easily, claiming my sixth gym badge. On my way to Cinnabar Island, I pick up an encounter in the water, being a Miss Leah. I pick up another encounter in the Pokemon Mansion, being Magiga, leaving me to face the island's bald game show master, Blaine. Like a lot of the other gym leaders, Blaine has had terrible luck with his typing, since huge power superpower is going to do a lot of work. The only thing it won't one-shot is his Celepom, but we can easily just swap into one of our many fire types, and even then, a swap back into Kalia is what finally does it in. But with our seventh badge collected, I'm not as excited as I should be about that. Because while this means we can evolve Magiga into Giriga, I am so glad we can swap these sprites around, holy sh**. You see, we've reached a terrifying part of the game. We now need to stop Team Rocket from getting up to evil shenanigans at Mount Ember. Meaning we'll have to face Zapdos, Moltres, and Articuno in a triple battle, except it's it's a single battle for us. The nightmare where Giovanni keeps threatening to take out my Pokemon keeps happening again and again. As Zap Malkuno enters, I realize I never nicknamed Dialdos, unfortunate name. As 
then exert my pressure, I'm immediately outdone by the three birds pressuring me into oblivion. Immediately, I miss a hydro pump, so we're already off to a terrible start as Articuno doubles its speed, I'm hit by an ancient power doing pitiful damage, and a flamethrower. Articuno, now faster, goes for another ancient power, putting me in the yellow, and this time I connect with hydro pump, putting Zap Molkuno in the red, which is kind of perfect since even though this discharge takes me out, it's also enough to take out Moltres. With the fire type gone, I feel a bit better sending in my dragon steel type, but a freeze dry still does some decent damage. A super effective iron head takes Articuno Kuno into the yellow, but a discharge does way more damage than I was expecting and gets me paralyzed. I'm forced to switch, and Emrakul seemed like a good idea at first since I've got super effective fire damage against Articuno. That's when I realized all these birds have ancient power, leading to a swift and promised end for Emrakul. At least this lets us switch in Char King for free, and while Articuno is still faster, an ancient power deals a fair amount of damage with a critical hit, a fire gem boosted flamethrower is enough to take out its remaining health. For some reason, flamethrower then does pitiful damage to Zapdos, so I'm forced to swap out again, this time sending in Kalia. Unfazed by Zapdos's ancient power due to her modern ways, she fires back with an Aqua Tail, getting Zapdos into the yellow. And with a swift second bathwater bottom bash, she takes out Zapdos, winning us the fight. With the birds defeated, we've split them up into their original forms, and Moltres even wants to challenge us to a battle. Because this is our first encounter in Mount Ember, we can actually capture it, and it's a Dusk Tina, which is awesome. In the final gym fight, we do have to face Giovanni a final time, this time with ghost types. But after facing him in a multi-battle in Silphco and versus his giant bird monstrosity, his ghost types really don't seem that bad, particularly when I have a huge power normal type that can just knock him out with a few play roughs. And look, it wasn't Giovanni's fault, he had some pretty stacked team members, we just stacked up a lot better. But even though we lucked out in a lot of our gym matchups, we now have to face a much greater challenge once we've reached the end Indigo Plateau. I begin my preparations by putting Giranoir on the team and swapping its fusion into this monstrosity. And thus I'd assembled my final Elite Four team. I'm bringing the Erd Dragon with Flare Blitz, Earth Power, Thunderbolt, and Surf. Kalia of the Vast with Quick Attack, Play Rough, Aqua Tail, and Super Power. Urabrask with Flamethrower, Shadow Ball, Will O Wisp, and Destiny Bond. Shield Red with Shadow Claw, Thunder Punch, Fire Punch, and Ice Punch. Steel Hellkite with Outrage, Iron Head, Sacred Sword, and Shadow Sneak. And finally, Draco with Dragon Claw, Dig, Crunch, and Zen Headbutt. Aside from the fact that all my Pokemon are at the correct level cap, at 65 and not 76, it's time to take on the first member of the Elite Four, Lorelei. With grass as her type of choice, we've got some pretty great options. With two dragon types and two fire types, hopefully this battle won't set us back too far since it's the very first fight of the gauntlet. We can deal a lot of damage to Jump Core with a quad effective Ice Punch, but not quite enough to take it out, which actually kind of works out in our favor since we can waste all of Lorelei's full restores. Once she's fresh out, she doesn't want to lose her Jump Core so she swaps into Mega Chan, which does take over half from an Ice Punch, being taken out by a second. Next is Stun Terra, a disgustingly cursed combination. It tries to hurt me with a Leaf Storm, which mostly results in it just dropping its special attack by two stages and then getting knocked out by the next Ice Punch. Her ace is a Musaur, or really more of an Eyesore. And while it barely deals any damage with Ancient Power, I'm not too happy with the damage output from Ice Punch, so I decide to swap out into Steel Hellkite as it sets up with Amnesia. It then starts charging a Solar Beam, which basically just gives me a free turn to attack it with Iron Head. The grand payoff is then to hit me with a Quad Resisted move as the combination of Iron Head and Shadow Sneak finish the Musaur off. Umtile is next, a Grass and Dark type, which is perfect since we've got Sacred Sword. The combination gets a lot of bulk from Umbreon, so a single Sacred Sword isn't enough enough to take it out, but with a second, we've knocked it out, leaving Lorelei with one final Pokemon. She's back to her jump core, and frustratingly, one Shadow Sneak isn't enough to take it out, so after she heals back a tiny bit of health with Giga Drain, I fire up the big guns and take out that final sliver of health with an Outrage. Second is Bruno, the master of steel types, and while they've got a slightly better matchup against our dragons, they're still weak to fire. Not knowing the matchup beforehand, I send in Kalia, which takes a lot of damage from an Iron Head, but a quad effective superpower takes Blastivile into the red. This predictably triggers a full restore, and another superpower can take Blastivile into the red again. I should have just predicted another full restore since I foolishly go for a quick attack here to try and get that extra bit of damage to take Blastivile out. Not sure if a minus two 
two superpower will be enough, I decide to swap in the Ur-Dragon, who takes a bit of punishment before not dealing enough with Flare Blitz. Realizing this thing's Dark Steel and not Ice Steel, I decide to go for my special attack instead and take it out with an Earth Power. Second out is Maghorn, which is quad weak to ground, which we have as Stab. What are you doing, Bruno? Third out, he sends in Bastical, which just has a terrible mouth feel when you say it. I send in Steel Hellkite, which takes barely any damage at all from an Iron Head before I fire back with an Iron Head of my own. I'm shot with Sticky Web to slow down my team, but my next Iron Head manages to get a flinch, and this time the Shadow Sneak is enough to pick up the KO. Fourth out is Nidical, which looks like someone stuffed a Nido King inside of a Shuckle. Wait, stop, no, 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 Nido King, that's not what I'm talking about! Well, it makes for a pretty epic combination, it doesn't make for a very epic attack stat as the average between Shuckle and Nido King. Its defense stat, on the other hand, means that it's gonna be pretty tricky to get damage on this thing with Shield Red at all. My best bet is to just spam Shadow Claw, which is doing a little bit more damage than Ice Punch, but even then, it's not that much. Fortunately, Nidical is just completely throwing by missing moves left and right, allowing me to take it out. Finally, Bruno has a Bastiok, hitting me with a Heavy Slam for basically no damage at all as I fire back with a Fire Punch. This is the point when I realized Bruno isn't using Steel types at all, he's using rock types. What I should have been doing here is paid attention and gone for Iron Head instead of Sacred Sword, since Bastiok's poison type makes Sacred Sword neutral. My past self was completely convicted, however, wanting to take down this Bastiok with my sword. It was a lot less efficient, but I decapitated the foul beast in the end. My third opponent, Agatha, is the master of normal types. We faced this matchup versus Blaine and had a pretty good time. And now that we've brought two ghost types, a steel type, and a huge power Pokemon with super power, I'm hoping this one should be pretty swift. Oddly, Agatha goes for a full restore when Sylvlicky almost has all of its health. As I said before, this is actually a really good thing since we're getting Agatha to waste all of her healing items on a Pokemon that doesn't threaten us. Third out is Milrow, and for a second, I completely forgot that Biro gets Drill Run now, dealing massive damage. I don't even deal that much damage back with a new neutral Sacred Sword, forcing me to swap out into Shield Red. It hits me with Drill Run on the switch and then Gyro Ball the next turn, but neither does very much damage, and I can fire back with a Thunder Punch, taking it down into the red, as Agatha then swaps out into her Murring. She then decides to be incredibly helpful, going for Memento to lower my stats, but faint in the process. With now just two Pokemon left, she sends in Purdash, and I send in Draco to get off and Intimidate. Assurance deals a pitiful amount of damage as I burrow underground, and a dig almost is enough to take Purdash out in one hit. The AI seems to love to withdraw their Pokemon when they're at super low health, so Milro comes in and just goes down to the Dragon Claw. Purdash then comes back to face its inevitable fate. Agatha's final Pokemon is a Dio gone too. Figuring I can probably take one hit, I decide to stay in and go for a crunch, which does over half. I realize it was probably a dumb move to gamble with Draco's life, so I swap out into Shieldred. The Deogon gives me a completely free switch by going for Magikote, and then just misses a Zap Cannon, as I completely forget it's a normal type. I'm eventually hit with the Zap Cannon, and of course paralyzed, so I'm forced to swap out, this time sending in the Ur-Dragon. Because he's immune to Electric, and Zap Cannon seems to be Deogon 2's only attacking move, there's now only one way that this fight can end, and no amount of boosting its defense with cosmic power is going to save Diogon from this final Flare Blitz. Before taking on the final member of the Elite Four Lance, he tells me that he's got a team full of steel types. He first sends in a Magna Blade, facing off against an old friend, Char King. A super effective Earth Power would take it out, but stopped by Sturdy, as it then goes for a Gyro Ball, barely dealing any damage. Lance then uses a Full Restore, getting all his health back, just to have it drop back down to 1 HP with another Earth Power. We continue this dance, and as always, I'm happy to just waste all of his Full Restores so that he doesn't have any when it matters most. Most. Eventually, he switches into Joltario, which is a terrible switch into a quad effective Earth Power. Lance then sends out. I try to deal damage with an Earth Power, but it doesn't even do 50%. The Orang fires off a Hyper Beam, getting a critical hit as if by divine right. As it recharges, I take my chance to knock out this higher power with a huge power superpower. Lance then sends back out his almost knocked out Magna Blade, which I just chip off the final hit point from with an Aqua Tail. Second to last out is Metcore, and as I swap out of my Fairy type, it goes for a Sword Stance. Lance then gets greedy and goes for an Iron Defense, but I plan to hit him on the specially defensive side with a Flamethrower. Lance then turns into a Game Thrower by just setting up another Iron Defense and allowing me to knock him out. With one Pokemon left, Lance reveals to me another god.
He goes into his sword form, dealing massive damage to Urabrask with Psychic as I fire back with Flamethrower. I don't want to be taken out by another Psychic, sending in Shield Red. My giant Phantasm is able to tank the Psychic above half as Mewtwo then goes for a cover when I hit with a Fire Punch. Amazingly, I managed to land the 10% burn, so after another Fire Punch, it's enough to take it out and claim our victory. But that's not quite the whole story, since there's still one opponent we must face. Lance did manage to take one Pokemon away from us, so let's see if it's enough to go up 5 against 6 versus Horn Lad. It's been a long time since we both left Pallet Town, and in that time, we've both managed to become the strongest trainers in the world. We begin with an Intimidate standoff before I decide to dig underground. Hornlad doesn't love the idea of getting hit by a quad effective dig, so he swaps out into Paralligator. The resistant hit barely does any damage at all, so I swap out into Shieldred to tank whatever move he's about to throw my way, but he just ends up healing with a full restore. Once I get hit by a Thunder Punch, ironically, I get paralyzed by Effect Spore, but he also gets paralyzed before using a full restore to heal back up to full. Once he's hit by another Thunder Punch, he swaps out back into a Ray to to lower my attack again with an Intimidate, and Thunder Punch barely does anything. I swap back into our original matchup, except this time I'm the only one who's got an Intimidate. Horn Lad completely wastes a full restore as I dig underground and take out the array with a quad effective hit. In comes Drifrath, which I'm guessing is a fighting and ghost type, so I send in my fairy normal type Kalia to have a good matchup versus both. I even swap right into a Phantom Force, giving me the chance to use a Play Rough to both take him down low and lower his attack. Horn Lad heals with a full restore, allowing me another free hit, this time taking him into the red. Wanting to hang on to Drifrath, he swaps out into Paralligator. I hit it with a Play Rough, which is almost enough to knock it out, but a quick attack the following turn seals the deal. With two of his Pokemon defeated, he sends in a Hitmondos and charges up a Focus Punch, which basically just allows me to knock it out in a single Play Rough. In comes Yandra, an epic fusion between Kingdra and Yan Mega, flinching me with an Air Slash and then getting a Speed Boost. All of that just to miss a Hydro Pump and almost get taken out in one shot with a Play Rough. Once again, I finish off the last bit of HP with a Quick Attack. Drifrath comes back in and through love at second sight, immediately explodes. She almost made it all the way to the end. I was gonna make a joke about her as she faints, but I can't bring myself to disrespect such a valuable team member. Left with one Pokemon, I know Hornlad is about to send in Magross. He sets up with Iron Defense as I decide to burn him with Will-O-Wisp. But then, something dawned on me. As he goes for Scary Face the next turn and not an attacking move, I realize that Urabrask won't have to bond its destiny to Magross because the key to victory is is already inherent in Urabrask's typing. The only damaging move that Magross has is Dynamic Punch, and because Urabrask is a ghost type, there's no way it's ever going to go for it. Unlike when the game put me in a position where I could only watch and lose, the tables had turned and all I had to do was sit back and enjoy my victory. Just like that, ladies and gentlemen, I had beat a Pokemon Infinite Fusion Hardcore Nuzlocke Randomizer on the hardest difficulty. Let me know who you thought was the MVP of this run down in the comments below while you hit that subscribe button. Personally, I think it was probably Kalia. And I'm really sad that she didn't make it all the way in the- Hey, Nidoking, what are you doing? <laughs>